You guys doing all right? It's good to see you this morning. And uh, man, I just want to give a quick shout out before we jump into the message today, because at the end of our worship time, our worship team led us in a song, and it might have been uh, strange to you, maybe been unfamiliar, and there's a reason why. It's a Summit Park original song that they wrote. Come on, isn't that great? Super, super pumped and love our worship team, love what's happening. There's so many great things happening in our church. Uh, we recorded that actually on Thursday, and it's going to be part of our church at home uh, that we do on December 30th. So we're going to actually not do church in the building, but we'll do church at home. We have uh, worship recorded and a message recorded for you. That'll be uh, a lot of fun, and we're going to make available to you that day a downloadable version of that song so that you can have it and worship. I've been singing it all week, and it just kind of gets in your spirit and and it just reorients your heart towards God, doesn't it? Just lifting up the name of Jesus. It's just a great song. Super thankful for it and super thankful for what God's doing in our church. Also, the little Advent uh, ornaments, super excited about what that's gonna be. This, at the end of the month for December 22nd and 23rd, our Christmas program here, the music's going to be amazing. And we've been uh, planning the music and the, the service and the testimonies. I'm telling you, it is going to be a game changer. The stuff in the parking lot's gonna be a lot of fun. So you want to be there for show, all right? So turn to the person next to you, say, you wanna be here. Just tell them, you wanna be here. You wanna be here. You wanna be here. You don't wanna miss it. Um, well, we're continuing our series called King Me. And uh, King Me, this whole idea comes from checkers. Checkers is this great, day, uh, great game of dominance where you exert dominance over the other player. You jump over them and then you take their piece. And then you get to the back line and they give you another piece just like yours. And you get to say the magic words, which are, everybody say it with me. King, King Me. You get to say King Me. And of course, it's a magical moment because not only do you get to go forward, now you get to go backward. You get more autonomy. You can go where you want, when you want. You can do what you want. And we think about this in life. This is what we're using as an illustration. We think that that's what we want in life, right? We want to do our own thing. And if we could just be more in control, we could go where we want, do what we want, say what we want, then we'll experience life at its best. But you know what we find out in this series is actually the opposite. When we get everything we want, we actually don't get what we really want. Actually, when we have more of ourselves, we move away from what we're looking for. We, we actually move away from life, not towards it. And this is the big idea for this series. And it's this, everybody say it with me. King me isn't all it's cracked up to be. Turn to the person next to you and say it. King me isn't all it's cracked up to be. It's really not. When I'm in control, I actually end up more out of control. What I don't want is to be in control. What I want is to give up control to the one who is ultimately in control, and his name is Jesus. And if you believe it, say, I do. It's true. It's true. When we give up control to God, that's when we experience God's plan, God's best, God's provision for our lives. And we're walking through the history of the nation of Israel because they're giving us a clinic on what not to do. They're actually giving us a clinic on, on how to take control back into of their lives. And they're taking control of their lives. They're saying, I wanna be in control. I wanna be king. They basically say to God, king us. And God's like, no, no, I wanna be your king. Like, no, 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 we want a king so we can be like the other nations. And we watch how their whole experience begins to go down and down and down, spiraling downward when they're more in control. If you're just joining us, I wanna encourage you to go online, summitparkchurch.com, check out the messages. They all build on each other. And uh, we're getting to the point in their story uh, where we're coming to one of the most famous passages, one of the most famous stories. It's the story of David and Goliath, all right? So let me just ask you, if you've heard this story, raise your hand up high and just high five the person next to you because everybody has heard this story, right? Everybody's heard it. You've heard it. If you've ever seen Veggie Tales, you've heard about David and Goliath. <laughs> if you've been to Sunday school, you've heard about David and Goliath. If you've watched ESPN, come on somebody, you've heard about David and Goliath, right? Every week on Saturday and Sunday, we hear, so Jim, well, what we've got here is a classic David and Goliath. What does it mean? It means the, the underdog versus the favorite, right? And we all like pulling for the underdog. 
We want the underdog to win. Like yesterday, we were all pulling for Georgia, weren't we? Come on. We just wanted to see Alabama go down. We're having church today. We love underdogs. We love underdog stories. We love when the underdog just... T- and so we think about David and Goliath. That's what we think about. It's programmed in our head to think about David, the little guy, taking on the big guy. But I want to talk to you today because that's actually not what the story is about. What the story is actually about is confidence and how to have your confidence in the right thing and not having your confidence in the wrong thing. That's what the story's about. So we're going to unpack this today. And as a society, as people, we like people with confidence, don't we? We like when someone has the right amount of confidence and humility. Now, we don't like arrogant people. Nobody likes that guy. But we like people with confidence. Like I was thinking about a surgeon. If you had to have a surgery, you want a confident surgeon, right? You don't want to walk in there and he's like, well, I tell you what, we've never seen this before, but we'll go in and we'll give it our best shot. You know, how many of you start like back on up? You know, I'll see you later, man. No, I'm good. I'm good. But you also don't want the guy who comes in there, oh, yeah, I can do whatever I want. I've got this. This is no problem for me. Uh You know, you're kind of like, eh, you're a little overconfident. What we really want is the person who's like, I tell you what, I think we're going to try this and that. I feel good about this. This is going to (coughs) be, excuse me. (coughs) I might need a surgeon right now in this moment. (coughs) Stroll over to the water table. Okay. You don't want someone who's overconfident. You want someone who's the right amount of confidence. And we all love this person, right? These people are heroes to us. I think about Patrick Mahomes. Come on, somebody. Dude's got ice in his veins. He walks out, the situation's just, I mean, he's just a, just a you know, he's 23. He just turned 23. And he walks out there overwhelming eyes, and he goes out there, and he's calm. He kind of has that cool look, and his, his hair flopping around. It's like, all right. Puts the helmet on, throws some bombs, you know? And you're just like, I love that. I love the confidence. He's just willing to go out and, and, and sling it. This is a story about confidence. And let me be honest with you today. You and I need confidence in life. Because life is going to present situations and circumstances that are overwhelming and that will crush you. You need to have confidence. There's going to to be moments when the doctor's report comes back and it's not what you were praying for and it's not what you were hoping for. And what do you do in that moment? You got to have confidence. There can be moments when your kids... Are, are, are facing issues and they're dealing with things or they're acting a certain way and you can't fix it. It's outside of your control. You can't solve it. And you need to be able to have confidence in that moment. When things aren't working out how you thought they would, you need to have confidence. And that's what the story is all about today. David and Goliath is a story about having confidence in the right thing and not having confidence in the wrong thing. And so we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to be breaking down this story. And I, I want to encourage you just to check your Veggie Tale version at the door, okay? And approach this with a new mind, a fresh mind. And one of the things that's important as we jump into this is to know that we cannot relate to these guys, Like, the context of this story is so different than what you and I experience, we can't understand it. So, basically what would happen is you walk through Israel's history, they're constantly fighting with the Philistines. And here's the thing, when they lose, if they lose, it's more than just, oh man, we lost the battle. Dang it, maybe we'll get them next week. You know, that's not how it works. They lose the battle, they lose their freedom. They lose the battle, they lose... The the government's gone, the king's gone. They lose the battle. They could become enslaved. They could become killed. So there is a lot at stake in this battle. And everybody knows it. Both sides realize what's at stake. This is what's happening in this moment. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Saul and the Israelites assembled at and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistine occupied one hill, 
and the Israelites another with the valley between them. And that's the valley is where they would fight. So a champion named Goliath, undefeated, heavyweight champion of the world, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp, and he was, his height was six cubits and a span. Most scholars believe that's nine feet, nine inches tall. It's pretty big, all right? So when he's doing, he's going on his tiptoes, he's hitting the, the rim of the basketball net, you know? That's what he's hitting, he's hitting that. When he dunks, he just goes like this, all right? So that'd be pretty good. That's Goliath. He's a big dude. And he's a champion. He's undefeated. And he's a bully. So he stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel. Skip down to verse 8. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. What he's basically saying is, let's save all this war stuff. There's a lot of killings. There's going to be a lot of bloodshed. Let's just, just mano y mano. I'll take someone on. Of course, nobody can defeat this guy. He's undefeated. And he's massive. He's huge. He's intimidating. He's nasty, he's dirty. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified, facing overwhelming odds. They're terrified. Now, here's what's interesting. I wanna pause for a moment. Because when we go back, if we remember, you rewind a couple of chapters, the whole reason the Israelites wanted a king was for moments like this. Remember? They said, give us a king so we can be like the other nations and he can go fight our battles for us. But they get the king and now he's terrified and dismayed. And I think it's such a beautiful picture of sin. It overpromises and underproduces. Can I get an amen? It says, oh, this is going to be so great. Oh, man, once you taste the forbidden fruit, once you get this freedom, once you're able to do what you want, this is the epitome of this series. Once you can go where you want, do what you want, this is what you want, and it's really what you don't want. What we really want is God in control. What we really want is God to be our defender, God to fight our battles. And this is what Israel gets. They, they get what they want, and it's not what they want. And it's also a picture of what happens when, when sin takes control of our lives. Because Goliath taunts the Israelites day after day. And that's what sin does too. That's what the enemy does. You give in, you, start, you, you, you taste the forbidden fruit, and then all of a sudden it taunts you, and it mocks you, and the enemy attacks you. And he, and he continues to undercut your confidence. He wants to undercut your identity. He wants to take away from you. This is what happens when sin reigns in our life. The enemy is relentless, and he attacks day after day after day. And this is the Israel, this is the whole nation of Israel. They get smaller and smaller and smaller as they hear Goliath come out and say the same thing. This is what the enemy does, the same thing, the same attack, the same scheme. And the whole nation is dismayed and terrified. David shows up. David is bringing snacks to his brothers who are in the army. David's not even in the army. He's watching sheep for his dad. He's just a boy. Most scholars believe he's between the age of 12 and 15. We don't know if he's hit puberty yet. For our, for our time together, uh, we're going to assume that he's not because it's going to be more fun. We'll see here in just a minute, all right? So he's, he's still... We're gonna go the 12 route on this in our interpretation today. And he's running an errand and he hears Goliath taunting the nation. And David says, no, not in my house. And with all of his might, with all of his strength, he goes to Saul, he goes up to the king and he says, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And some of you are like, I'm pretty sure that's a gingerbread man from Shrek, Scott. <laughs> it's the best I got, y'all. It's the best I got. He's a boy, all right? <laughs> He's a boy. And Saul replies appropriately in a sense. He says, you're not able to go out and fight this Philistine. You're only a young man. He's insulting him. He's like, you're just a wee little lad. Go on your way. He says, Goliath has been a warrior from his youth. 
He insults him. And you, you see, David is amazing. He feels this to his core, and, he, and uh, he, as any teenager would, he says, you don't know me. <laughs> he does, watch, in verse 34. He says, you don't know me. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it, and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. Now, this dude is bad to the bone. Come on. Like, this dude is, I mean, that's like, that's real stuff right there. He said, I seized it by its hair. I struck it, and I killed it. All of a sudden, Saul's like, okay. He says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. You don't know me? Mic drop. And then he walks off the stage. And you just think, oh, maybe this is just adolescent attitude. It, but it's not. It's actually not. Because watch what he follows up with. He says this in verse 37. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Where is his confidence? The Lord. His confidence is not in what he can bring to the table, but what God can bring to the table, who God is and what God can do. This is real confidence, and this is the confidence that you and I can have. This is the difference. This is game-changing confidence. This is ice in his veins confidence, but it's not based on his ability. It's based on God's. Saul said to David, well, go on. The Lord be with you. And then what Saul tries to do is to outfit him with his armor, he tries to put his armor on him and David's a boy, and Saul, we know, is the tallest person in the country by far. So it doesn't fit. Of course it doesn't fit. But Saul's thinking in the natural. We're going to see how that trips him up. But David is thinking in the supernatural. David's like, listen, this isn't going to work. It's not how I roll. This whole thing's going to be a miracle anyways. So let's take off this armor, and I'm just going to go find a few stones and give God something to work with. All I need is something for God to work so he goes and he picks up these stones and, and it's amazing because I think David, when he goes out, Goliath's over there and Goliath's like, he's kind of going off and he's saying, let someone come down and fight me and David kind of comes out there. <laughs> and, and Goliath is like, are you kidding me? Like Goliath is ticked. I think David kind of likes it. I think David's kind of just like doing some stuff. I think David's kind of messing with them. Like, David knows. He picks up the stones, and he's like, you are going down, soccer. And look at what Goliath says. Verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine with the shield bear in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over, and he saw that he was just a wee little bat, lad, a little, just a little boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He's like, how dare you insult me? This is your warrior? And he said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Don't you think Goliath should have an Australian accent? <laughs> and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He said, come here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. <laughs> All right, it's, it's, it's intimidating, right? He's nine feet, nine inches tall. This is scary stuff. Now, if there's ever a moment for David to reconsider his actions, it's right here. You know, he hears Goliath basically roaring, intimidating. He's sweat, he's nasty. He's, David's got an up-close view of this enemy. This would be a great moment for David to be like, on second thought, <laughs> you know, Goliath, I think there's just been a, a big misunderstanding here, and I've got some snacks that I brought to my brothers, but I can bring them out to you if you want. Like, this would be a moment for him to backtrack if there was one. And we have these moments and these opportunities as well. But watch how he responds. Verse 45. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. We're going to find out that Goliath was well armed. He says, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of not just you, 
but the whole Philistine army did the birds and the wild animals. Throws it in his face. And check this out. And the world will know that there is a God in Israel. When God moves in our life, do you know this? That the whole world will see it. The whole world want, will see what God can do in our life. And all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the, come on, everybody, say it with me, Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Where is David's confidence? It's in the Lord. And he will give all of you into our hands. Now watch this, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, he starts going, I'm gonna wipe you from the face of the earth. David ran. I love this. But where did David run? He ran toward him. Do you know when your confidence is in God, you can run to your problem. You can run to the thing that is overwhelming you. You can run to it when your confidence is in God. And he ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. And he reached into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and he struck the Philistine on the forehead and the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground and died. David experiences victory and it came because he was confident in the right thing and Goliath and Saul were confident in the wrong things and we're gonna unpack that here today. And it has everything to do with having a godly confidence. Having a godly confidence. Confidence that is rooted in the Lord. So we're gonna unpack this. Before we do, turn to the person next to you and say, godly confidence looks good on you. Just tell, tell someone, godly confidence looks good on you. Let me, let me, let's unpack this. Two wrong places to put your confidence, one right place. And the first one is this. Goliath is confident because of what he has. Goliath is your typical bully, right? He's big, he's tall. He picks on other people. Hollywood loves these guys, right? It's Biff from Back to the Future. Anybody remember Biff? Picking on Marty McFly or Regina George from Mean Girls? It's your typical bully. These are the people we love to hate. But he's not just a bully. He's not just a lumbering big guy. He's a champion. He's a champion. He's undefeated. He's strong. He's a warrior. And he's got the latest gear, too. We find out in verse 5, he, he had a bronze helmet on his head. This is a time when, when people didn't have any armor. He had armor. And he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. And on his legs, he wore bronze greaves. And a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His, his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. And his iron point weighed 600 shekels. And his shield bearer went ahead of him. This dude was decked out. Basically, no one's getting near him. No, no arrow is gonna pierce him. No sword is gonna pierce him. By the time you start hitting him, his shield, his armor's gonna stop it, and he's just gonna wipe you from the face of the earth. That's why he's undefeated. That's why he comes out like this. You know what? I think about Goliath. He's always been this way. How many know he was always the tallest in his class? How many you know he was the first one picked at recess every time? It may be hard for you to believe this, but I was never the first person. I know, it's hard. I was never the first person picked at recess. But I know that guy, and you always wanted that guy on your team, right? You always wanted the Goliath on your team. Oh man, they got Goliath again. Goliath was the captain of his football team and his basketball team and his lacrosse team. He was captain of everything. He was unbeatable, at least so he thought. Goliath for us today is the guy who trusts his strength. Goliath for us today is the guy who trusts his size, is the person whose confidence is in himself or herself and what he's done or in what she's done or what she can do. It's the person who trusts his intellect. It's the person who trusts his retirement portfolio. It's the the girl who trusts her savings account or her degree or his track record or his work ethic. Goliath is the person whose trust is in himself and his ability to make good decisions. This is Goliath for us today. And you know what this is? 
It's selfish pride. It's selfish pride. And this is a trap that we can fall into. It's very easy for us to fall into this trap. We can call it a Goliath trap. It's where we think that what we have can get the job done, and we put all of our confidence in that. And this is what's been tripping humanity up from the very beginning. It's what cost Satan heaven. It's what cost Adam and Eve the garden. It's what cost Samson his strength, and it's what will cost you and I our strength as well. It's Goliath traps. It's where we put our confidence in ourselves. It's where we put our confidence in our ability to get it done, trusting your instincts, looking within yourself. This is what the world tells you, right? This is opposite of Christianity. And this is what, this is what Goliath misses out on. What Goliath misses out on is God. See, Goliath thinks that he's got himself here. Goliath thinks he's so strong and that he'll, he's done it before, he'll do it again. His confidence is in himself. He doesn't pray. He doesn't go to God. He trusts in what he wants and what he can do. It's a Goliath trap, and you and I can fall into it too. Goliath believes that he can get it done. And let me just say, this is the quickest way to experience defeat in our lives. I'm not gonna pray about it. I'm not gonna ask God about it. I'm just gonna do what I want, where I want. Go. This is the epitome of King Me. And this is the opposite of Christianity. Goliath misses out on God because his trust is in himself. Let me just ask you today, are you approaching your life like Goliath? You say, well, I, I, how would I know? Well, when you approach a decision, are you thinking about what you need to do or are you thinking about what God wants you to do? Are you thinking about what you could bring to the table or are you thinking about what God can bring to the table? Is your, is your whole life centered on you and what you want or is your life centered on God and what God wants? This is the difference. You know you're a Goliath when your focus is on yourself and what you can bring to the table. Okay, secondly, Saul... Saul isn't confident because of what he doesn't have. So Goliath is confident because of what he does have, and Saul is co isn't confident because of what he doesn't have. Saul is a naturalist. He, he sees things, he's a realist. He sees things in the natural. All he sees is what he can bring to the table. Verse 11 says, On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were terrified and dismayed. He's, all he's seen is what, what is what is real, what is happening. We see it how he interacts with David. You're, all, you're not able to fight this Philistine. You're only a young man. Saul sees what he has, and as a result, he's afraid, and he becomes dominated by fear. Now, here's the thing. Saul was a warrior, an experienced warrior. He was the best suited to take on Goliath, but he's a realist, and he's no dummy. He knows that he's gonna lose this fight if he goes out there. How many realists do we have in the house? You, you can see things, you can size them up, you're able to be like, nah, this isn't gonna work. This is not gonna work. And all the faith people are like, oh, let's believe God. And you're like, y'all just dumb. <laughs> y'all just dumb. Because this ship is going down. <laughs> That's a realist, right? And you know what? Here's what's amazing about Saul. He's right. He can't win this. He is not going to beat Goliath on his own. But here's the good news. He's not on his own. But he forgot. He forgot that he wasn't on his own. Here's what's amazing. Saul had experienced the miraculous in his lifetime. But he had got away from it. Because he got away from it, he stopped trusting in God for the miraculous. Like, we're not even talking about stories like, you know, Joseph and, and, and Moses and all of that. Like, I mean, obviously Israel had that to hold on to. Saul had experienced the miraculous in his lifetime, but he forgot. And let me just say, this is why it's so important to write down when God comes through for you in a big way. Have a journal that you keep, and you write that miracle down. So when you're facing a situation like Goliath, you can go to that and you say, nope, you came through for me there. You came through for me there. You came through for me there. And God, my, my hope and my focus and my confidence is going to be in you because you could do the miraculous again. See, Saul misses God, and he misses out on the power of the miraculous. Saul's right. He doesn't have the ability to do this on his own but he forgot that he was never on his own. 
And because of it, he misses an opportunity to be the king that God wanted him to be, that God had destined him to be. And David is exactly the opposite. David is confident because of who his God is. Not because of what he has and not because of what he does not have, but because of who his God is. And there is a difference. David believes God, and at his core, he believes that God is good and God does good, and that no matter how terrible and difficult the situation might look, that God can do anything. He believes it. And because of it, he's able to overcome. Watch verse 37. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Faith in God, confidence in God, assurance that God is with him. That is unshakable. When your faith is in God, it's unshakable. When it's in yourself, it's shakable. Whether what you can bring to the table or what you cannot. But when, when it's in God, it's unshakable. This is David. And I just have to think that David, as he was getting ready to face Goliath, he was thinking about some of the Psalms that he had written. You know David, he wrote most of the Psalms. You know why he wrote the Psalms? Because he knew God. He had a relationship with God. Do you know where confidence in your walk with God will come from? A relationship with God, a real relationship with God. In fact, let me just say this. You will only know victory publicly when you know victory privately first, in prayer. Where did David learn all of this? He learned it out in a field watching sheep as he wrote songs to God. He was, just, he was, he was, he was a worshiper. He knew God. And you can know victory publicly when you know humility before God privately and experience the victory that he has. And I believe this, as, as David was getting ready, he's, as he was picking up those stones, he started, he started quoting some of those Psalms. Like, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And then he puts, puts one of the stones into the slingshot and maybe he goes to Psalm 27, which he wrote, Lord, is my stronghold, or my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And he's looking at Goliath, and his confidence is growing. His confidence is getting stronger, not because of how great he is, but because of who his God is. Where is your confidence today? God invites us to have it in him, and he starts swinging that slingshot. And when he starts running towards Goliath, I think he had to go to Psalm 118 where he said, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? And he let it go. And maybe he had his eyes open, but maybe he closed his eyes. Didn't matter. Because how many know that stone had to be miracle blessed anyways to bring down the giant, and it did. Maybe, maybe he totally missed it. Maybe he just went, ah! You know, maybe it was like that. You know, ah, I'm trusting you. And, it just, and the stone just went. It's like heat-seeking missile. It's possible with God, and it had to be. It was a miracle. That's what's available when our confidence is not in ourselves, what we have or what we don't have, but who God is. Come on. That's what it's about. So let me ask you today. How are you approaching your life? How are you approaching your difficult situations? How are you approaching those things? Is it about who you are? Is it about your plan? Is it about what you can bring to the table? Or is it about God and what he can bring to the table? Or maybe you're, maybe you're more like a Saul and you're saying, you know what, I, I'm just overwhelmed because I know this thing isn't gonna happen. This thing is going down. And you're not seeing the miraculous. You're not looking for God's miracle hand. The response to both of those is to respond like David and say, I'm confident because of who God is. Let's pray.